Morning, church. Kingdom kids, dismissal. Kids are more than welcome to head on out and learn their lesson. Church, we have an epidemic on our hands. It is a disease that has borne its way, uh, not literally into the hearts of every person, every individual, but borne itself into the very core of our society as a whole. Did you know that 85%, 85% of youth who are currently in prison grew up without a father in the home? Did you know that 7 out of every 10 youth that are housed in state-operated correctional facilities come from a fatherless home? Children from a fatherless home are twice as likely to drop out from school before graduating than those with a father in the home. We haven't really valued dads and haven't really valued and been taught what it means to be a dad, how important it is. Now, I've got this written on your outline and those numbers have just grown. But between 1916 and 1990, the number of homes without their, and again, biological dad present, went from 17% to 36%. And no kidding, one out of every four kids don't have a father figure in their life. We know the issue, <laughs> right? We've gotten to the state that we've gotten in because we haven't valued family the way that it should have been valued. We haven't valued parents in general, let alone that of the father figure. Now, for a long time in the United States, we didn't have modern medicine the way that we do now, so a lot of the fatherhood statistics that you'll see beginning, you know, 50, 60, 70 years before this, well, it's because the father died in the household, right? If we were to look at the 1940s, there was a drastic drop in the amount of fathers that were in their households. Well, we could obviously compute that, the war, right? There are obviously certain times where we can pin certain things on what, what's, what's up with the fatherless homes. Well, in our modern day, we don't really have much war going on, lots of rumors of wars, but no real war happening where fathers are having to leave their households. We haven't had drastic drops in health care or anything like that. We know why we have fatherless homes, and it's because we live in a society that has not valued the patriarchy. We have not valued what it means and how crucial it is to be a dad. We are living in times where it is much more popular, much more popular to talk about motherhood than to talk about fatherhood. Now, in this sermon, you ladies that are mothers and grandmothers, thank you. We talked about that a month ago, <laughs> right? Today we're going to talk about fatherhood, and I want to give an example of an awesome dad. One that cared for his family physically, spiritually, made sure that his household was maintained. Now, we don't have all the time in the world to look at all the scriptures about fatherhood. We're going to be here all day if we take the time to look at all the perfect examples and the wonderful examples of dads in the scriptures. I want to take the time to focus on one. But there is a reason why it is so important that we as the church take back, again, not just fatherhood, but parenthood in general. Because the amount of households without, and I'm not even just talking good parenting, just parenting in general, parents there and available, is, has drastically, drastically taken a drop in the last few decades. And it's taken these drastic jobs because we haven't valued and seen how important it is. Let the statistics show, right? I've got a whole list here, and I'm not going to read all of them, but of 40 different statistics about what happens when there is not a father simply present 
in the life of a child. Did you know that children who live in a single parent home are more than two times likely to commit suicide? Having a father present in the home saves lives. <laughs> it just does. And we have to get back to a church that not only preaches on, but cares about family values. Go ahead and turn to Job chapter 1. Now, if you recall the story of Job, and again, Job is 42 chapters, so I do not have time to preach the whole book of Job. You want to talk about an amazing book, an awesome, awesome book. On the study of suffering, how do you overcome it? On the study of why do bad things happen, that's a great study. On the study of what do we talk about with God in those times? On the study of what should we look out for? On the study of sin? On the study of righteousness? There are a hundred topics that we could talk about from the story of Job. Let me begin here in chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men in the east. Let me first discuss Job just for a minute. Now, there's question marks as to when was Job on the earth? Some think that Job is much later in time. Some think that Job is much earlier in time. I'm going to give you my opinion. Believe whatever you want on Job. But it seems like the book of Job leads us to an idea, a time frame of when was Job on the earth. I believe Job was on the earth, on our present earth, at about the time, probably a little bit earlier than this, than the time of Abraham. Right? We're talking the book of Genesis. And most scholars agree with this. If you were to plug in the book of Job during any time period, you would plug it in somewhere in the book of Genesis. Some think that it's pre-flood. Some think that Job was a man, one of the only righteous men, perhaps, during his days, leading up to the flood. Some think that Job is one of the only righteous men after the flood. Who knows? It doesn't give us a chronology for Job. It doesn't really give us any other info on Job other than the fact that he was one of the greatest men of the East. Right? I mean, that is Job. This is who we're talking about. So just to give you a little bit of time frame. But I also want to talk about Job from a spiritual standpoint. You want to talk about a man who was wholly devoted to God. And we're going to discuss that in all of this. But the first thing that I want you to notice, and let me continue here in verse 4. And his sons used to go and hold a feast in the house each one, uh, of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it came about when the days of feasting had completed their cycle that Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my son has sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. I want you to know that Job is obviously a man who cares for his children. And I don't just mean spiritually. Spiritually, we will talk about that as well. But physically cares for his children. Do you know how much you've got to care for your children to have ten of them? <laughs> Do you know how much you have to like children to have ten of them? You don't stop at six, you don't stop at seven, you don't stop at eight, you don't stop at nine. No, 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 you finally round out at ten. And by the way, after, if you remember the story of Job, Job loses these ten children. They are feasting all in the same house. This wind gets driven up, and it says that it knocks out the four quarters of the house. All of his children pass. And then in Job chapter 42, we won't turn there, but Job chapter 42, guess how many children he has again? Ten. Job's like, Job likes kids. <laughs> he obviously cares for them. He nurtures them. For him, they are a blessing. Well, here's what we've done with fatherhood. We have made it seem as if children are not a blessing, but a curse. I don't know if you know this. This is going to be revolutionary. And I mean revolutionary. The only way that you become a father is to have children. You guys are good. 
The definition of fatherhood is a male who has kids. That is the definition. It is defined by children. Males who do not have children aren't dads. Right? Does that make sense? I'm not trying to fool you here. This is, you know, basic, I hope. But we've defined it differently than that. We've made it to where fatherhood is having children that you care about. But we're not sure if you ever care about them. This is, and, and again, I'm not trying to, trying to speak towards the negativity of a father. But we do have to talk about it. Children are a reward. Not a curse. And if you spend any time around the world as a dad listening to other dads, you know what you always hear? That your children are a curse. They make me spend money. They make me spend time. They make me spend what I don't want to spend. Right? I mean, that, uh, fathers, we treat each other when we're talking as dads like children are gremlins who suck everything dry out of you. Right? That's the way that we talk about them. And that's not at all the way that God depicts them. Can I say, can, it's funny, but it's true, right? The vast majority of people, that, fathers, that you will talk to on a regular basis spend their time speaking negatively about their children. I had to take them to baseball practice. Well, why'd you sign them up for baseball, right? I had to spend the money on their clothing. Well, why'd you have a child? Why'd you do it? I don't want to take all the time to talk about this. But the vast majority of time that I spend with fathers, and this include husbands, are them speaking negatively about their wives and their children. Uh, ladies, I don't know if you know this, but I'm going to let you in on guy conversation. My wife went and spent this money on the kids this week. That's the conversation. And us being upset about it. It's already negative. It's already a disservice to, I've got a loving wife and kids that I cherish. And Job didn't think that way about his children. Can I tell you how I know Job didn't think that way about his children? Verse 5. Here's what Job did. Job would send them and consecrate them. We'll talk about that. Rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. You know what Job did? I don't know if every morning, but a lot of mornings. He went out to his 3,000 3, camels, 7,000 sheep, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and he would, perhaps every morning, go out and take 10 of them and sacrifice them on behalf of his grown children. Perhaps some of them lived in his household. Perhaps it seems as though some of them didn't live in his household, right? They're old enough to go out and have their own feast. They're old enough to go out and go to each other's house, right? They probably have perhaps children of their own. Who knows, right? Either way. And Job is giving up of his possessions, his wealth, his animals, Right? In our modern day, this would be like, all right, every morning I'm going to go out and sacrifice $100 for each one of my children. Now, I'm having to buy a new vehicle this week because our van broke down. The transmission went out on our van, so we're having to buy a, a, a new vehicle. I'm not going to do that right now for my children because we need that money just a little bit. But that's the equivalent of what Job is doing here. Continually. Can I tell you how I know Job cares about his kids? Because he's willing to give up of his own possessions on their behalf. Just to cover sin. That's how much Job cares for his children. Do you, want, do you want to know how much Job cares for his children? I mean truly cares for his children. He not only has ten and they pass. God blesses him with another ten. And Job's okay with it. In fact, he loves them to death. 
that's how much Job cares for his children. He didn't view them negatively. They weren't cockroaches. They weren't leeches on his po pocketbook. Now, it's easy to say, well, Job had a big pocketbook. Yeah, that's true. Job did have a big pocketbook. I'm sure that Job would have been fine with being poor. There's nowhere to indicate, well, Job was rich. That made it easy for him. Job, I'm sure, would have greatly sacrificed everything for his children. What wouldn't have Job given up so that he would have passed and not his children? What wouldn't he have given up? And even when his wife comes to him and says, Job, look at what's happened to you. Curse God and die. And he says, I'm not going to do it. You want to talk about a loving father. And it even says for us in verse 1, blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Do you know what it takes, by the way, one of the number one priorities, and again, we'll talk about this, of a good father? It's leading by example in your spiritual life. And that's what Job did. That's what helped him to get through this situation to begin with, where he becomes cursed and he loses everything. Right? Here very quickly, right, if we were to read through this story, we see that Job loses everything. All of his servants, except for the ones that are able to come back and tell him the story, die. He loses his sheep and his donkeys and his camels, his children. The only thing left is his wife and his friends who are not comforting him, but tell him, well, Job, you've sinned. You should just curse God and die. That's all he's got left. And you want to talk about a spiritual, upright, blameless man. By the way, this word blameless doesn't mean that Job was perfect. I don't want you to get that intention. Job had sin in his life. That's why he offered up sacrifice, not only on behalf of himself, but his children. But this idea of blameless is that he's forgiven. God is constantly wiping away his sin. That is the picture of this blameless man. If you always speak negatively of your kids and, and that of your spouse, you will always view them as negative things. You just always will. Children are meant to be a reward. One of the greatest reasons, and this shouldn't be your only reason, but this is a reason that you should have children and love them and take care of them and raise them to be godly is so that when you're 80 and you need the diaper change, they're there. Right? The way that you put on diapers when they're the little baby is the, you know, you expect the same back. And I cannot tell you the amount of dads that I've run into, and don't get me wrong, I understand, I don't like doing it either. But we need to quit holding this up as a totem, because we as men do this, I've never changed a dirty diaper. Go home and change the dirty diaper. Because that's what being a father means. You care about your children. I know if anybody ever comes to me, and I've had people do this, and told me I've never changed a dirty diaper, what is it telling me? You're never with your children. You are apparently never with them. Because if you are around a child at all, they're going to need about ten of those a day, if not more. It means you're not around them. It means you never let your wife leave the house, ever, and you watch them, because you're going to need to change it. Secondly, though, what was Job concerned about for his children, first and foremost? Their spiritual lives. A feast happens, right? Now, some people say, what is the feast? I, I have no idea what's going on. Perhaps it's a hol holiday. It's very possible they're celebrating a holiday. Right? If you go read through the book of Genesis, there's never really any holidays mentioned. That didn't come around to the book of Exodus when the law gets brought about. Right? Perhaps it's a holiday, perhaps it's birthdays. He's got ten kids, what does it mean? There's ten birthdays to have throughout the year. Perhaps somebody, you know, there's a celebration of marriage. I don't know what feast this is, I have no idea what's going on. But not only does he sacrifice on their behalf for each and every child, meaning giving up of something on his behalf, and he even says... Perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. He, he can't quantify whether or not they've sinned. He doesn't know what they've done. But I want my very best for my children. Perhaps they've sinned. I want to make sure that they are covered before our Lord and before our Creator of what He's asked us to do. So I'm going to go out and sacrifice. 
he says and it states that he would send and consecrate them. Now, uh, there's a question behind, what does that mean? Consecration, usually in the Old Testament, meant some kind of ceremony of the setting aside of holiness, right? Did this mean that they fasted for a breakfast? That could be. Does this mean that they had a washing ceremony? That could be, right? Could this simply be that they sat down and prayed? That's very possible. I don't know what all the consecration, the separation of his children involved or anything like that. But he was invested in their spiritual lives. And again, keep in mind, these aren't two-year-olds. These are perhaps 22-year-olds. He's invested in what their relationship is with God. As men, as fathers, we need to be encouraged and lifted up to be involved in your child's spiritual lives. He sought to be blameless and be the perfect example for his children. Job woke up daily sacrificing on behalf of his sin. And what did it lead to his children to care about? The sacrifice for their sin, their daily consecration, their setting aside for God. By the way, our culture has taken away this phrase, and there's nothing wrong with this. You might cringe at the thought of it. I don't want you to cringe at the thought of it. The word patriarch. Patriarch is not a bad term. All that patriarch means is that there is a father as the leader of the household. And that is not just an Old Testament idea. That is also a New Testament idea. We don't have time to talk about it, but go read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It talks about a father as the head, the man as the head of the household. There is a reason Ephesians chapter 6, we read this last week, Ephesians chapter 6 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but raise them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Why does it say fathers and not mothers? Because fathers are the head of the household. There's a reason for that. That's not a bad thing. That is God instructed. Job knew that. And that's how he lived. He lived his life caring for the spiritual lives of his children. He sacrificed his things. Not even knowing if there was sin. But caring that much about his children and their relationship with God. Are we encouraging fathers... Are we as fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers? Are we leading spiritually? Are we being a good example? Are we being the teachers, the priests in our households? Because it's God commanded that we do that. That we discipline and instruct in the word of the Lord. His desire was God's desire for his children. Job's desire was God's desire for his kids. It doesn't tell us their occupations. I don't think Job cared. It doesn't tell us what kind of mortgages they had on their household. I, I, I'm sure that Job cared, but, but it's not important. It, it didn't tell us anything about his children. But what it did tell us is that Job cared for them spiritually. And by the way, if you'll notice, the theme throughout the scriptures, the total theme for fatherhood in the scriptures, is care for the spiritual lives of your children. Right? Let them go out and do the work that they want to do. Okay. Let them go out and, and marry when they're going to marry. Right? But make sure that they are living spiritually, godly-led lives. That's the role of a father. And has our society not torn that apart? We've made it quite the opposite. Tear down the patriarchy. We don't want men in charge because they've been messing it up for the last thousands of years. Well, I don't know if you know this, but look at our society when we've tried to tear that down. Is it getting better? Nope. In fact, it's going, again, quite the opposite. Lastly, 
And let me continue reading here. Verse 13. Now it happened on the day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, that a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabians attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the cannibals and took and slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another one also came and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Now, if it were me, number one, I'd have a lot of questions. Because as these servants are telling him this, another one is running up, and another one is running up, and another one is running up, right? I had our van break down this week. That is nothing like what Job went through. You have not experienced anything in your life <laughs> like what Job is experiencing. Perhaps you have experienced the loss of a child, the loss of a home, the loss of possessions. Job lost everything in a matter of minutes. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. Now, doesn't that seem contrary to what the vast majority of people would do? And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Number one, was Job right in his non-blame of God? Yeah, because who actually did this? Satan did, right? This was not at God's hand, any of this taking place. This was at Satan's hand, this taking place. <coughs> There's that cough, I was waiting on it. But in all this, instead of rage, anger, frustration, in all this, Job did the normal customs of, of pure loss, shaved his head, tore his robe, sat in ashes. He fell to the ground and he worshipped. Job has just lost ten children. Once. At once. I cannot imagine losing both of my boys at the same time. Let alone if I had ten. And he worships. He knew who was in charge. And he knew whose children they really were. God's. See, folks, here on the earth, fathers, mothers, we're parents for a very short time. God is a parent eternally, for all time. Who really brings life? Well, God does. Who really allows it to thrive and flourish here on the earth? God does. Who allows us to become parents? Well, God does. Job knew whose children these, his, his children really were. They were gods. They were gods. By the way, I think that everything would feel secondary to his children. You lose all your possessions. Uh, I lost my children. I lost my house. I lost all my servants. I lost my children. Right? I feel like everything would feel secondary to that. Right to that one scope. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Could you be Job, and at the end of all of that, say, blessed be the name of the Lord. I, I don't know of very many people that could do that. Right, that could totally be prepared for that situation. That's why Job was singled out. 
as the most faithful man on the planet in his day. Right? Literally, in this story, don't have time to read it. But Satan comes to him and asks, right, this big question of God. And guess who the Lord picks? Job. By the way, this is not a story for you not to be faithful. There are some people who read the story of Job and they go, I don't want to be very faithful because God will pick me for a big test. No, be faithful. Be very faithful. Yes, you might get selected for a big test. That's true. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Don't put your children, your spouse, above God. Your children are precious, and you care about them. You should. Your spouse is precious. You should care about them. They are a blessing from God, but they're not God. They're not God. We have encouraged fathers in our society to not only either, one of two things, don't be present or care about the things that don't matter. One of the two. And I want to fight both of those. The things that you should care about and the thing that we should understood is at the end of all of this, the worship of God is your most important aspect. It's the most important aspect as a father that you can have. I know that it's easy to feel like a failure as a father when you don't put bread on the table at the end of the day. It's easy to feel like a failure as a father when the job's not working out or when the vehicle fails or when the plumbing gets messed up in your house and your house gets flooded. It's easy to feel like a failure as a father when you don't take care of the things that you feel like you need to take care of. Your number one priority Our society should be, as fathers, taking care of the spiritual health of your family and yourself. That is the number one priority, and Job knew that. That's why he wouldn't blame God. They were gods to begin with. (laughs) I'm their father here on the earth, and through the flesh, I'm their father. But the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. He just worshipped. He didn't know what else to do. Other than worship. Wouldn't it be nice to get to a state where somebody cuts you off in traffic and all you know what to do is worship. That's all you know what to do. Tragedy strikes. Terrible things happen. And this does happen all around the world constantly. You don't know anything else other to do than to bow down and worship. Job had the right attitude. Job had the right perspective on everything. Don't put your kid's success before their spiritual success. Don't do it. It's not worth it. You'll have a multi-millionaire as a son, but they won't be part of God, and it will all have been for nothing. It will all have been for nothing. You will have successful children. You might get the Major League Baseball player, but if they're not a part of God's family, what was it worth? What was that all worth? Those baseball lessons are not as important as God. They're not. For your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids. I want you to go out as grandparents and go watch their baseball games. I want you to. Do that for your grandchildren. They'll love it. They'll love you. But I also want you to talk to them about God after the baseball game. Do that too. Don't forget about those steps. I want you to read them a book before bedtime. I want you to do that. But I also want you before bedtime to tell them that God loves them. Tell them that too. Don't forget about that. Because there is something bigger at play here. Don't make your children the head of your household by doing the things that you and they want to do. You are the head as a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, through God. By the way, we as fathers are heads of the household. That is true. Who are we heads of the household through? God. Right? Don't forget, it does say in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it does say that men are the heads of their household. Do you know who it says is the head of man? Christ Jesus. 
<laughs> Don't forget about that. A lot of people love to say, I'm in charge. Well, yeah, you're in charge because God allows you to be in charge. Don't forget that. <laughs> We're in charge because God has given us the responsibility of being in charge. But what are you in charge of? The instruction and the discipline of your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. That's what you're in charge of. I don't want you to leave here thinking that, hey, I've told all of you fathers here in the room, you are the head of the household. You do what you want. No, that's not what I'm saying. You are the head of your household to lead them in the right spiritual direction towards God. That's why. It's not a question of value. I don't want you ladies to leave here and think, well, pff, that preacher only believes that men are in charge. No, it's not because you ladies are less valuable by any means. It is important for a child to have a mother. You be there for them too. It is important for you ladies to be grandmothers. You be there for them too. But scripture does state that men are the head of the household. And there's a reason for that. I want to flip society on its head. Because we have too many fathers who think that children are a curse. And you know what they do? They will literally pack up their things and move when they find out that either their wife or their significant other is pregnant. When did we get there? Why did we think that was okay? You want to know the number one reason why there aren't men in households today? We often think it's because the father packs up the things, the things and leaves. It's divorce. It's divorce. Now, I know that's a sensitive subject for some. Sometimes it is a tough subject. But those things are, are rarely, rarely worth the upbringing of a child. The spiritual upbringing of a child. And if we're not careful, we're going to flip it. And we're going to get it wrong, as we've already been getting it wrong. Did you know in the United States today, there are over 20 million children without a dad in their lives? 20 million. And it's been progressively getting worse and worse, and we haven't talked about it much. Satan's really good at convincing us of the exact opposite of holiness. Do you know what it, what it I mean seriously, one of, the, one of the trends of holiness as a father is to be there for your children. And hasn't Satan flipped that to make it seem like children and wives are curses? Do you know that 40%, I, I mean this is, this is, this is nuts, 40% of children that are born today, 40% of children that are born are born to parents that are not married. That's crazy. And it's because we have not valued family, we have not valued marriage, and we have not valued children. We just don't, we, we, we haven't valued it. Even in the church, we haven't valued it the way that we need to. We haven't preached on these things like we've needed to and, and really hammered down on it. Your job as a parent, mothers and fathers, is to raise your children spiritually. Give them the foundation for godliness, and it will pay dividends. And again, you're not also, we talked about this last week, you're not just doing it for your children, you're doing it for their children, and for their children, and for their children, and for their children. Lead your kids. Love your kids. Don't leave your kids. Don't leave them to figure it out on their own. Don't give it to chance. Love them. Push them in God's direction. Give them a foundation for godliness. The reason that we are dads is because we have kids. And that's a huge responsibility. And it's an awesome responsibility. I've said, there is nothing that has ever made me happier in life than my wife and my kids. You know, I thought about last week, my, like I said, my van broke down. And I was in Walmart trying to see what I could do. <laughs> calling every place to see, hey, what's going on? And uh, I was also calling, guess who else I was calling? My dad, <laughs> to figure it out. 
And as I was talking about it, I was sitting there in Walmart just going, because <laughs> you know what's in the back of my mind? Well, here went a lot of money down the drain. Here went my time down the drain. How am I going to get home today? <laughs> what's going to happen? By the way, I was here at work. So, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, well, how am I going to get home even today? And all those things are running through my mind. And I got back to the church. It got me back to the church. <laughs> I got back to the church, and I just tossed it out of my mind. I went. It'll be fine. It'll just be fine. And you know what helped me get through that? I thought, I've got an awesome wife and two beautiful boys sitting at home who, even if we don't have a running van for the next few days, will be fine. They're the most precious things that you can ever have in your life. Don't forget what's most important. Don't view them as negative things. They're positive things. Speak positively about them, and you'll find yourself thinking more positively about them. Yes, they do suck your wallet dry sometimes. <laughs> they do. That's okay. Money is less important than your wife and your kids. They're more important. And their spiritual lives are more important than those things. Now, you may have said, well, Jacob, you only preach to the fathers today. What am I supposed to get out of this? Encourage the father in your life to lead godly. Uplift them towards it. Help them in that. Right? It's easy to speak negatively of fathers. Right? How many of us can speak negatively of our fathers and fathers-in-law for what they do in our lives? Right? We can sit around and groan about that all day. Encourage them. Uplift them. Help them to be better husbands. To be better fathers. Grandfathers. Great-grandfathers. Right? Help them in that. If you're a child <laughs> of a father, right, there are plenty of steps to be taken towards helping out your father <laughs> in being raised in the discipline and in the instruction of the Lord. Lead your kids. Love your kids. Don't leave your kids because it is not worth it. As we stand and sing your hymn of invitation today, don't we in heaven have a loving father? Do you want to know how much our father loved us? He sent his son to die on the cross for us. That's how much our Father loved us. Church, I want you to love your kids with that same kind of love. Sacrifice for them. Be there for them. Comfort them. Guide them. Because that's what our Heavenly Father does for us each and every day. And I mean, seriously, can't we just talk about all day what an amazing Father we have in heaven? That's a sermon. And that's 50 sermons. And that's 150 sermons. And it goes, and it goes, and it goes. Let's stand and sing your hymn invitation today.